Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, this is a question that a lot of you have asked about, and I wanted to wait because I absolutely wanted to go to the most thorough resource we could get for this answer. So today we're going to be joined by the head of the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife, Captain Eric Anderson. Now, for those of you who've been geeking out on this channel for a while now, you know this is the second time that Captain Anderson has joined us, and we are very grateful for him to donate his time to us and his wealth of knowledge. So today we're going to spend a few minutes talking about when can I use deadly force against wild animals in Washington state. Okay, before we get rolling, you guys know the drill. If you like this video, click the like button. If you want to stay up to date on issues related to your Second Amendment rights, click the subscribe button. Click the little bell logo if you want to be notified when we post new videos. And let's keep the comments and discussions coming. That's how we're getting our videos out to more people. Now, for those of you who have been watching the channel for a while, you know that we've already talked about using lethal force against domesticated animals, dog attacks, and things like that. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is wild animals. That is, we are out in the great outdoors and journey, enjoying many of the great natural resources that our state has to offer, and we are encountered by some kind of a wild animal which endangers us or other people in our presence, and that requires us to use lethal force. When is that justified, and if we do, God forbid, end up in a situation like that, what exactly are the officers with the Department of Fish and Wildlife going to be looking at in determining the lawfulness of our actions? All right. Well, once again, we are joined by Captain Eric Anderson of the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now, Captain Anderson, this is the second time you've been on the channel. Thank you very much. Why don't you briefly uh, introduce yourself to all our viewers? Okay, thank you. And thank you again for having me on. This is a great opportunity to get good information out to the public on this stuff. So uh, like I said, I'm a captain with the Department of Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Program. I'm a game warden at heart. Uh, been with the department now. I've been a game warden for 26 years. Uh, worked my way up the ladder, but been an officer out in the field, sergeant out in the field, and have a lot of experience with dealing with problem wildlife. Um, which is kind of what we're going to talk about today. So, and, and in addition to obviously uh, being huge into our natural resources and that, you are a strong 2A supporter too, if I remember correctly. Absolutely. Strong supporter of the Second Amendment. All right. So the topic we're going to be talking about today, and I had a lot of viewers ask this and, and, and I wanted to get it straight from you. I wanted to get all the information is, can we use lethal force to defend ourselves if we are being attacked or are we are endangered? Uh, by wild animals. Now, um, for most of the people who geek out on this channel all the time, we're talking about using lawful force against other human beings. And so the law is very clearly delineated for that. There's kind of this escalating of force. The more force you're encountered with, the more force you get to use. But when we're talking about using force against wild animals, we don't have these bright line rules. So how does agents in the field working under your, under your command, how do they assess these situations when there are reports of wildlife being killed in defense of human beings? Well, it, it, believe it or not, it's actually a lot like the escalation use of force with human interactions. Um, the thing that we'll put into it is, did the person, were they prudent and reasonable in what they did to defend themselves against the animal? And, you know, I'll, I'll even just go on to what, you know, what is self-defense first? It's the protection of one's person or property against some type of injury by another or even another, you know, animal. And so, again, did you, there's, it's an excuse to use force. Um, for killing something, they're killing an assailant. So, so that's self-defense. And so if an animal attacks you, yes, you have the absolute right to, to, to defend yourself. So the question is, is were you prudent in how you did it? Were you reasonable with the act? Did you do, did you do things um, in advance that justifies the use of lethal force on that particular animal? So uh, and we'll get into, I know that we're going to get into some examples later on, and, and maybe that, that's a, a way to show um, when I talk about that, what is reasonable sure. and how it's justified. But, but one of the things I want the viewers to, to kind of get a grasp on is, is that there is this more enigmatic, big picture view that Department of Fish and Wildlife is going to take 
as it relates to use of force when it comes to wild animals. And you were talking about the reasonableness of it. So for example, when we're talking about force against by another human being, we clearly have no duty to retreat, but there is no clearly defined what's reasonable there when it comes to if you're being attacked by some sort of wild animal. There's additionally, there I imagine there are some things that people can do that could entice the wild animal into a situation that then creates the self-defense situation that would be weighed as to whether or not their use of force was reasonable based upon what they did prior to their use of force. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, yes and no. So, so okay. if somebody did something, so like one of the things that happens, and we're going to talk about cougars. And if you encounter a cougar and you're in close proximity and say you turned and ran, that could trigger in, in felines, that triggers the chase, catch, and grab right. um, situation. So if all of a sudden you turned and ran because you were scared and the cougar jumped on you, started attacking you, and you killed it, we're not going to charge you. It was, you, you, it was reasonable. The cougar, sure. the cougar attacked well, Let's you. say instead of the act of them turning and running, they uh, set out bait to attract cougars to the area because they wanted to capture some on a trail cam or something like that. There we go. There's where we're talking. What was the actions of the person? And to all of that would be them. assessed, though, wouldn't it? Yes, it absolutely because, would. Because if you see an animal that you think is deadly and you start running, although it might not be the smart thing to do, it is reasonable under many people in many people's minds because it's that oh my god moment. We I got to get out of here. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Now it was a good segue because there's a couple of animals I wanted to talk about in particular. In in your experience, being with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife for as many years as you have, what are the two most dangerous animals that we actually have uh, in this state? Okay, well, the two, two uh, and it's kind of a interesting to call them dangerous, but the two main animals that people um, feel are dangerous and have a fear of are the cougar and the black bear. And to tell you a little bit about, um, the what do you call it the habits of these animals to because one of the things that again there's a myth um there's these things out there that you know a cougar's going to jump on you it's going to kill you it's going to eat you, it's going to do this and, and in reality a cougar is a very very secretive and solitary animal by nature um they don't like humans they they tend to stay away from us as much as they can they're we were talking about this before we started taping about how the cougar gets this kind of unfair reputation as being mm -hmm. a very deadly and vicious animal but the statistics the actual data doesn't necessarily bear that out does it oh absolutely not um so the what you're talking about is actually looking up for this in all of North America, to include Mexico and Canada and the United States, in the last 100 years, there have been 126 cougar attacks on humans, of which 27 have been fatal. In 100 in years, we've had- Washington, how, how many have we actually had on record? In the state of Washington, we have actually had two um, fatal cougar attacks, um, but realize that they are they have been 94 years apart. So- okay. Uh, the first one, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of background on the first one occurred back in 1924. Um, so many, many, many years ago, and it was actually in Okanagan County. And it occurred from what I was able to research, it occurred on a snowy evening in December, um, very rural, very kind of mountainous area where when a young 13 year old boy went out um, looking to get his family's cattle back herded it herded back in and he was by himself and apparently he was attacked and killed by a cougar um they assembled a hunting party uh and went after the cougar this also included a, a from the research a government um hunter that had um hounds and over the course of several weeks they actually caught and killed uh several cougars the last one of which was they determined that it was actually the cougar that that, that killed the young young man um, because it was very distinctive. It had a missing claw on one paw. And so they were actually able to track it and they actually sent the stomach contents from that cougar to a university in California that determined that there was human hair and bones still in its intestinal tract. And then now the, unfortunately we had a more recent one that was just a few yep. years ago that actually got some notoriety here and that occurred when and where again? 
that actually occurred over in, I want to say King County, and it was in 2018. It was, yeah. it was May 19th. And what's unusual about this one was that the Cougar actually attacked um, two mountain bikers. And it ended up killing, killing one of one of the mountain bikers who even tried to, to fend it off. There was some um, thoughts on it that this was a, a, a emaciated cougar that, um, you know, couldn't couldn't go out and catch regular deer or elk after after they actually did some looking at it. It actually was a very healthy, young, what we would call sub adult cougar. Mm -hmm. And so the hypothesis on it is actually that even though the, the bikers did everything that they, they could be right, this cougar just had it in his mind that these were, as they went by on the bikes, that it triggered the chase and catch and kill in, in that young cougar. And no matter what they were going to do, I mean, unless they had a firearm or something else, um, they had the fight on their hands. So we actually found that cougar um, short distance from the body. We were able to dispatch it. And yeah, it was it, it was the cougar that did did the deed. Right now, just again, uh, because we're we're getting to the time of the year here where weather's getting nicer. We're going to get our hikers out there, our mountain bikers. Everyone's going to get back out there. So the likelihood, of, and of course, you know, many of these animals are coming out of hibernation now. So mm -hmm. so the like the the increased likelihood of encounters is going up significantly this time of the year what's some advice you can give people as it relates to cougars if you encounter a cougar out on the trail somewhere out in the woods mm -hmm. well the first thing actually if you're not out so we're also going to talk about hunting too and generally when you're out hunting you're being quiet in the woods and sneaking around trying to find your prey um cougars again they try to get away from humans so if you are out hiking and biking and things like that um, talk, talk normally. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a, a, a huge thing to do um, when, when you're out and about. The other thing that uh, you want to do with this is, um, you know, if you encounter a cougar, if, and the chances are, again, are slim to none, but if you see it, start talking loudly. Make sure that you stand up tall, raise your hands up in the air, appear to be a big target do you you want that cougar to um, think that this is something i don't want to mess with make yourself um, big and loud right big and loud big and loud make noise uh throw things you can throw things at the cougar you know make sure you face it talk firmly to it yell at it hold a jacket wave things don't take your eyes off of it the one thing that you don't want to do if if it's there and you see it don't turn and run that is that is the thing that again it will it it, it triggers in felines the I'm going to chase and catch that thing. So that's why you want and it to will catch you and they will catch you. Yes. They are fast and they're big. They are made for taking down deer and elk. Right. And th the thing of it is, is again, uh, um, you're honestly the chances of encountering a cougar or seeing a cougar in the wild, just as a running across them is, is so slim to none. Right. Um, I am an avid outdoorsman, obviously, uh, and my job and, I have never actually, when I've been out hunting or hiking or anything like that, ever seen a cougar. Um, You've never seen a cougar in the wild. Never seen a cougar in the wild. Now, wow. now I have I have seen a cougar in, in my job as an as an sure. officer. Sure. Um, uh, in fact, I I have euthanized two that had predated on livestock. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Now there there was another animal we were going to talk about, and that is the black bear. Okay. Yes. All right. Black. So okay. again, this is an animal that gets uh, a bit of a bad reputation and the data doesn't necessarily bear out that this animal is, is as dangerous as many of us make it out to believe. Right. 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 And in fact, actually black bears generally, and we'll get into this, don't get dangerous unless we do things to actually get them to be dangerous. So the black bear is actually the most commonly and widely distributed bear in North America. Um, I can't tell you what the population throughout North America is, but in the black bear population in the state of Washington is generally between 25,000 and 30,000 animals. And they live all the way from the coast, all the way into the dry woodlands of, of Eastern Washington. So, well, 
they're often associated with forest cover, but again, they, they live in a wide variety of habitats. Now, a black bear is omnivorous. They really do eat whatever is easily available. Um, easy calories are what they want. So the thing of it is, is as our population, human population has increased and we have moved in more and more into these, these urban environments and, and sprawl out into the forest area areas, we're having more and more encounters with bears. Right. Um, it's not so much that the bears are coming into our communities. It's that our communities are going out into their territories. Exactly. And that's why we're seeing more encounters, not only with cougars, but with bears as well. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And then since, since we're kind of in, encroaching on their habitat, and there's things that we do as humans that actually makes it very attractive for these bears that want easy calories. Again, they're, they're an animal just trying to get by and easy food and easy calories is the thing that makes them survive. That's where they start having these interactions with humans because of that. Now, but the, now the data in the state of Washington on the number of actual fatal black bear attacks shows us what though? We have had one fatal black bear attack in the state of Washington. And what year was um, that in? And that was in 1974. Um, there, well, actually, some things leading up to that. We've actually had 13 cases in the state of Washington where somebody was injured and the one death as attributed to black bears. Now, what's what's really interesting in that is six of those cases, the bear was not the initial aggressor. The, the, the bear wasn't at fault. In fact, it actually was hunters, six hunters shot a black bear approached it thinking it was dead and well they approached too quickly and it wasn't the bear acted in self-defense <laughs> and the bear and the bear the bear decided to defend well, it lawful self-defense <laughs> yes the bear, <laughs> bear was the bear was being reasonable and prudent in yeah it was he was. So, it was it certainly had been met with lethal force so yeah. so in four of the other actions that again out of these 13 it actually was dogs man's best friend that were off leash that the people were taking them into the woods and they chased off into the woods, you know, smelling something and started barking and biting. And all of a sudden here they come roaring back and here comes the bear hot on their tail. Mm -hmm. So again, the dogs were actually the aggressors. And then right. as we say, the other, the remaining three we have are the one was the fatality, like I said, and that was in 74 and a four-year-old girl based on what I could see was down in Glenwood, um, Glenwood, Washington, which is in Klickitat County, very rural up on the slopes of Mount Adams. Um, she was mauled and killed by a 250 pound bear. Um, and at the time, apparently her father shot and killed the bear. From the accounts that I got, it sounds like the bear was close to some type of a potential food support source or whatever, and it got startled. But again, the account is, you know, many, many years old, there's not a lot of records on it. So that's one of the things that, that, can actually happen with bears is if they're surprised by humans and they are either at a food source because they def they will defend their food source or if it is a female with cubs okay. they will they will if they're surprised with their cubs they will defend their cubs okay. so and then actually one of the one of the attacks that were that wasn't fatal um that actually resulted in pretty substantial in in just injury, excuse me, to the, to the individual, I called it the perfect storm because you actually had, and this was in 2010, and it was a person in Eastern Washington who was walking his dogs. They were on leash, but at night, rural area, um, and came into contact with a 150 pound black bear that actually was habituated to the area. It was a garbage bear. It was getting into, yeah. it was starting to talk so, about that in a minute here and the danger yeah. of that. And so he was, he was injured, but we actually tracked down that bear and uh, officers found it and it was euthanized. Okay. Well, you know, so one of the things that we talk about all the time on this channel is being the lawful and responsible gun owner. And, and many of our viewers uh, love the outdoors and the natural resources that the state brings. And so in keeping with that theme, there are a lot of lawful and responsible things that we can do as citizens in this state to avoid the likelihood that we even have these kinds of contacts. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's, let's, let's break it down a couple of different ways. Let's talk about what we as homeowners, cabin owners, like I got a place out in Cleelum that I try to spend as much time as possible. You know, we got not only our primary homes, 
but it's for those of us who have vacation properties or cabins and things like that. What can we do as homeowners, home renters, things like that to minimize the likelihood of these types of contacts? Okay. First and foremost, don't feed bears. <laughs> um, it's illegal. And, and we can talk about that, that law in the state of Washington. But, but again, there have been people that will put out food to attract bears so they can take pictures with them and show them to their friends. And, and that is just a recipe for disaster. Over 90% of the bear human conflicts result from bears being conditioned to associate food humans humans equal food and so again you don't want don't don't do it deliberately because on top of that it's illegal so okay. next thing on it um manage your garbage if you are in these uh, um urban environments where you're back and up to forests and lands where there could be take care that your garbage does not become a an attractive nuisance to these things again bears are looking for easy calories and food scraps in your garbage is that so if you have so if if you know you're in that area, um, one thing you could do, uh, you could get a bear-proof garbage container. Those are, you know, actually commercially available. But if you don't want to do that, if you have pickup service, put the garbage can right out before the garbage truck comes. Don't put it out the night before. Um, take and uh, if you don't have pickup service, frequently go call your garbage to the dump. Um, store your um, garbage cans. Make sure that they have airtight tops and store them in sheds or the garage or someplace so that you can't the, the smell doesn't get out if you can smell it the bears can smell it right. and bears, then bears are basically taking the path of least resistance the easier abs- it is is the one they're going to take every time they're they're they are intelligent animals they know where they can easily feed themselves if it's available right Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a human going to a McDonald's, uh, right. a, bear, a bear sees a, a, a garbage can. And that is, that is an easy, you know, an, an easy Big Mac. So yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, and then of course we got a ton of people that are out camping, doing all of that out mo- mountain biking, hiking, all of that stuff. So uh, as lawful, responsible outdoors people, what can we do to avoid contact in those settings? Um, if you're out camping, keep a clean camp. Again, contain your garbage, put your food in bear safe containers, cook away from your tents. Again, those smells attract things. Um, hike in groups. Okay. When you're, when, if you're going out hiking and you got several people hike together, stay close together, keep your children, small children close, keep your dog on leash. And the other thing is make your presence known talk normally again I, there's there's often things people will get out in the woods and all of a sudden they start whispering and i understand that as a hunter but when you're just hiking and enjoying nature talk normally because um most likely if the bear or cougar that is in the area hear you they're going to leave again um 99.999 percent of the time a bear and a cougar wants nothing to do with a human we are danger to them um so out in that settings if they hear you coming they will go the other way and then the other thing that that i recommend as a prudent outdoors person is get yourself some of this stuff if it comes through bear spray mm. um easily um available over the internet uh, I actually got that at, at Costco. I carry that myself when I actually go out hunting and hiking. Um, and, and here's the important thing about bear spray is if God forbid you get in a situation and you deploy bear spray in self-defense, the likelihood that you're even going to have to meet with a fish and wildlife officer is incredibly remote. Yep. So the bear is not going to report you. Nope. And, uh, and again, nobody's hurt. The bear, you know, is obviously going to recover from this every, and, 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 you know, disaster averted. But if we deploy lethal force and we know bear spray is designed to be a less than lethal use of, of force, but if we deploy lethal force and we now have a dead wild animal, we're going to have to explain the reasonableness of that Exactly. To a fish and wildlife officer, right? Yep, absolutely. One other point to note on it. So I, I trained law enforcement, been trained in use in deadly force, stressful situations. So if, if gun owners know the size of a bullet and in trying to discharge at an animal that is that they're scared and, and or the animal's charging you or that, uh, you have a high likelihood of missing mm-hmm. their target with, with, with the bullet. Um, 
bear spray, and it doesn't show up very well, but bear spray actually has a higher likelihood of connecting with the animal. It sends out a big cloud and, and you have, you know, instead of a, a you know, 0.24 diameter um, right. bullet hitting it, you actually have, have a big cloud that's up to six foot in diameter that will hit that bear or that cougar in the face and it will deter them. It has been shown time and time again that bear spray is absolutely effective in these things. Now, this is interesting. We were talking about this before we started taping here, but um, there have been, we were talking about getting animals accustomed to interacting with humans through intentionally feeding them or you know, allowing our garbage to be accessed. As it turns out, this has become such a problem in this state that we've actually had to pass legislation that outlaws this. I, I was not aware of this, but there are two statutes that I want to talk to you about. One is 7715-790, and the other one is 7715-792. And one is negligently feeding or attempting to feed or attracting large wild animals. And the other one is the same crime, but intentionally doing so. Tell us about how these laws even came into existence. Well, the big trigger on these actually, I'm going to say it was... Oh. About 10 years ago, if I remember right, we actually had a case down in Pacific County where we had um, a, a couple that were feeding, actively feeding bears in their backyard. And when I say actively, they were going through like 100 to 150 pounds of dog food a week. And they had eight bears coming into their backyard in this community that they were, you know, exposing and they habituated them to humans. Um, we had to step in because it was a dangerous situation. And out of the eight, I want to say we ended up having to euthanize five of the bear. We had to kill them because they were habituated. We couldn't do anything. So, so here's the people think they're doing something nice, making life good for the bears. And it ended up costing five of them their lives. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it made, and it made an actual absolute dangerous nuisance for their neighbors. Right. So, so that's actually what was the trigger on this. And so those, the, the two laws, the first one that you talked about, that's actually kind of like the first offense. It's an infraction and a, a perfect example when, and I'll tell you back in the history of this, about 20 years ago, when I was a young officer out in the field, I actually came on a situation where a person called me and said, Hey, I was scared. I had to kill a bear. It was in my front yard. And I was like, oh, okay. So I showed up and sure enough, here was a dead black bear in the person's front yard, 20 feet off of their porch. There was a swing set. Everything was, you know, okay, this, this, this could have been a dangerous situation. And I started talking to them, but I'm trying to figure out why the bear was there. And so I started to walk around their house and here on the other side of the house was a huge, absolute pile of garbage bags. They had not, I mean, and when I'm saying huge, there was like 50 bags of garbage out they there. They hadn't made a dump run in months. They hadn't made a dump run in months, and it was tore apart. The bear had been coming into that. Yeah. And so at that point, if I would have had this statute way back then, I would have, I would have, um, probably gave an, an infraction to the person and said, clean this up as it was. What I told the person, I said, okay, you've attracted the bear. This one is your, is your free one. I am giving you a warning on this. You clean up this, this garbage. Otherwise, if you come back and you've killed a bear in your, in your yard again, like this, um, I'm going to cite you for close season wildlife, mm -hmm. you know, close season hunting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, and so, and now, so on a first offense that, that negligent uh, feeding, that's an infraction. But if we continue on with this activity, then it it actually gets criminal in nature then, doesn't yes, it? Yes, then it becomes a misdemeanor. Okay, okay. Well, Captain Anderson, listen, this is, as usual, been a tremendous wealth of information. Is there any information in general you want to give our viewers about how to manage themselves when they're out in the great outdoors, how to deal with wildlife, and what the most important thing just to remember is? Well, the main thing is don't do actions that could um, enhance... <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your chances of interaction, like we talked about, if you're just out recreating in, in the outdoors, um, you know, do the things, be noisy, <laughs> keep a clean camp, um, and then take the steps. Again, I guess we'll get into one thing like, so uh, like a scenario, I'll throw this out to you for, for your viewers to talk about it. So like if you're hiking down a trail, and a cougar happens to cross the trail in front of you 100 yards ahead, is it, would that be a, a 
reasonable lethal use of force for the person to shoot a cougar that's 100 yards ahead of them probably not probably not so right because they're not imposing any kind of a threat at that particular moment yeah so and now, now though to, to take what you guys would do let's say they are on notice that a cougar is in the area the reasonableness of their actions would be assessed if things did lead up to having to so for example they're like oh god there's a cougar let's start making a bunch of noise let's do exactly what that captain anderson said on that youtube channel so they start making a bunch of noise start making themselves loud big all of that and the cougar still chooses to pursue an attack of now the reasonableness of their actions is very quite reasonable isn't it yes quite reasonable you know right. did i do these things did i right. did i turn around did i did i make myself bigger as the cougar approached did i did i and again so we're talking firearms when it's still out there ways could you fire safely fire a warning shot if you're carrying a sidearm and the cougar runs off absolutely okay now if you fired the warning shot and the cougar keeps coming at you okay i'm i'm going up that use of force continuum and when it gets to this point, okay, I'm going to defend myself. So again, that's how we're going to assess it. Yeah. Did the person take, did they take steps to try and not lethally take the animal first? Mm -hmm. Did they do things to try to avoid a lethal encounter? Or was anything done that would entice the animal into acting towards the human, such as leaving garbage out or acting in a way that's literally meant to attract? This is all things that your officers are going to be looking at in the field if they're standing over a dead wild animal and they want to determine whether or not this was lawful or not, right? Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, Captain Anderson, as always, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks again to Captain Anderson. We really appreciate him being willing to volunteer his time and all of his expertise in that area. Listen, you may have more questions about this issue or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or, of course, you call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.